the good news is there are no bad ideas. Why is that good news? Because, well, I can't have a bad idea. This, the bad news is it doesn't matter. It's not about ideas. This is not about ideas. Ideas are not important in dramatic narratives. That's a mouthful to say and gets me a lot of criticism. I was at um, a scholarly conference. I was telling you that I rarely go to scholarly conferences. I go to a lot of writers' conferences. But it was at an academic scholarly conference. And um, someone said at a writing panel, uh, this was out of town. This was up in Montana. Um, he said, you know, the problem with your program at UCLA, I really wanted to hear the rest of this, <laughs> um, is that we encourage writers to, to write screenplays that are get ready now because I've memorized this too deeply encoded into the dominant narrative mode. I'll say it again. We encourage writers to write screenplays that are too deeply encoded into the dominant narrative mode. So I thought to myself, what in the world is that? And then I, I realized narrative is usually what they say when they mean story. I heard myself say to him, because I was very confused, I said, you, you mean story? And he said, um, yes, yes. And I said to him, um, guilty. You're right, that's us. We, we're story hardliners. We think it's all about story. Um, he said what we should be doing is, is inculcating into new writers the, the uh, respect for the value of ideas. Sounds great, doesn't it? But I was saying, well, I'm so sorry, but we think ideas are worthless and useless. Again, it doesn't go over very well, but it's the truth. Uh, any real writer who, who's a serious writer who has any kind of success will, will tell you it's not about the idea. And sometimes when they say, oh, I got a great idea, and they, they really believe that it is a great idea, it's not just an idea. In fact, it's a story that's all worked out. For example, with King's Speech, it's not just a guy who stutters and hires a speech therapist. It's the King of England. It's World War II. You know, but all of this, as you start to describe it, it's no longer just the idea. Now you're telling the story. I'm going to say it again. It's so obvious it's, it, that it's, it's hard to see. Uh, sometimes things are so obvious you just can't see them. And again, here it is. It's all about story. That's all it's about. It's about telling a good story. Yesterday, on the front page of the New York Times, big article about Philip Roth. There's no more successful writer than Roth. Um, he's 79 and he's announcing that he stopped writing, at least stopped writing fiction. And um, uh, I wrote down a quote, again, this is on the front page of yesterday, Sunday's New York Times. He says, writing is frustration. It's frustration, not to mention humiliation. That's a verbatim quote. Um, I realize I've actually memorized it now. Um, it says Roth. Roth has had 31 books published, 26 novels published. Um, bunches of them have been made into movies. He's made a great deal of money. He has a beautiful apartment on the Upper West Side. He has a gorgeous home in, in um, Connecticut, uh, in the countryside. Um, he's had as much success as any writer has ever had. And he finds it frustrating and humiliating. I mean, that's what art is. It's a, uh, I've never known any artist who was worth anything, who was really, really satisfied with the work that he did. Among the writers who come into our program who want to be successful, a, a majority of them is 100% a majority. I mean, every one of them wants to be a successful professional, and that's what we want them to be. We are a professional school, and our great uh, uh, success is their success. Um, they're doing fabulously well uh, in, in all media now. You have to assume it's not going to work out. Um, God is watching. If if she sees you take it for granted that uh, it's going to work out, then it's not going to it's not going to work out. Um, if you need certainty, uh, you shouldn't even start this. If you need to know for sure that you'll succeed at it, you just have to get into the stream and hope for the best. Uh, and at the at the end of the day, let everybody uh, else betray you and and shortchange you and let you down. But at least you be true to yourself and. Keep the writing coming. You got, you got to 
crank the stuff out. You have to keep the stuff coming. That's the most important, the most important part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, what is a writer trying to do? She's trying to literally trade her daydreams for dollars. Writer, you know, she's trafficking in her own imagination. Uh, you know, writers get scolded for what other, I'm sorry, other people get scolded for writers, for what writers get praised for, and that is daydreaming. Um, uh, what could be better than that, you know, to literally uh, live by your wits? Uh, so a lot of people are going to compete for it, and it's going to be difficult to uh, succeed at that. But at the end of uh, your life, let everybody else have let you down. But at least you be a warrior for your for yourself. We do rejoice in an embarrassment of riches here. We do see our students, for the most part, succeed and have uh, successful professional lives. But um, I like to think that they don't really expect that. They certainly don't take it for granted that that will come to pass. If they do, they will they will not succeed. Every writer uh, wants to jump over everything always, as, uh, including myself. I don't consider myself to be a terribly important writer, although I, I'm a much experienced one. The Wall Street Journal calls me a writer of substantial professional experience. And I have done a lot of work uh, in screen, but not only in screen, I'm also uh, the author of uh, best-selling fiction and nonfiction, And I've also written um, uh, short films. Uh, you know, commercials, uh, propag corporate propaganda, um, sales films, films, f uh, instructional educational films. Um, the uh, uh, so I'm hugely experienced, and yet I still want to jump over <laughs> all of the requirements. But every time I try to do that, I realize I can't. That it just takes time, and you have to give it the time, and that's the most difficult part of it um, because after all time is what your life is is made up of and uh, I mean time is like the currency of life if somebody wastes my time um, I feel they've killed me a little bit you know they've taken part of my life away and um, uh, that's what art wants it wants your life you have to you better be, be ready to give your life to this if you want to be a, a screenwriter it sounds cynical and dark, but I mean it the opposite way. I can't imagine a, a, a more wonderful thing to give a life to than creative expression. Um, imagine uh, people who do succeed as writers, they're literally uh, swapping their daydreams for dollars. They're, they're trafficking in their own imagination. What could be more wonderful than that? Uh, I think it's cause to, to rejoice, not to despair, but, but to rejoice. You know, getting your butt into the chair and your hands on the keys um, and seeing where it goes. I believe you have to have an outline, um, but then you got to, like, throw away that outline. Um, it will uh, uh, take paths that are surprises to the, uh, the artist that created it. I've never known any anybody who uh, ever wrote anything that wasn't surprised, who wasn't surprised by... Di lines of dialogue that the characters seem to invent by themselves and twists and turns in the story. Uh, I remember asking Neil Simon, do you laugh at your own jokes? And he said, sure I do the first time I hear them. And I think that's fantastic that he actually hears them. It's as if somebody else is telling them, telling these jokes to him. And that's the experience I think of a lot of artists. Uh, it's not, I, I wrote a Twilight, I sold a, a Twilight Zone episode years and years ago about a uh, muse, it's a sort of a, a composer of commercial jingles and his muse uh, that proposes, if I, I'll spare you the story, if I told you the story, you'd think, hey, what a good story. Um, but they, uh, the, the thesis underneath it was the notion that muses don't desert their artists, it's really the other way around. You have to be available. Uh, it's never easy to get in into, uh, and you have to own that, you have to know that. Uh, I'm not sure that answers what's the first thing you do. Usually something occurs to you that seems kind of odd, you know. Imagine if this happened or that happened. I remember when our first child was going to be born, uh, we went to birth classes, you know, birth preparation classes, and, uh, which were held at Cedars um, Sinai, and everybody was supposed to bring a pillow. So suddenly outside, you know, near Beverly uh, Boulevard, near uh, 
San Vicente, whatever it is. Like all of these um, couples, all of the women are quite pregnant, and everybody's carrying pillows. You know, what's that about? Uh, imagine, you know, you're waiting, you drive past a bus stop, and there's like 60 people at the bus stop, and they all have accordions. I don't know. They all got accordions for some reason. What could that be? And how could that? You start to think about that. Um, and also, you don't think about it. You just sort of like let it simmer and, and cook, and maybe a notion will come to you, uh, and that you start to play with it. Uh, and 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 see how it unfolds. I know there are uh, other people, including people you're talking to, I'm sure, who have much more precise steps. Uh, I reject that in my own work and in the work of the writers that I know. Uh, again, I think uh, that it's a um, uh, a function of surprise. A lot of art is, and the the important thing for the artist is to stay open to those surprises rather than try to drag the narrative back to some previous intellectual preconception. My answer to that is yes. Both, uh, right? Yeah, you know, they, they are born, but they are also nurtured. Uh, that is to say, they have to, uh, I think nurturing is a big part of it, but it's really a lot about, about uh, discipline. I think a very, talent is what you're born with. Uh, maybe discipline can be learned to some extent relative to the way that you're brought up by your parents and, and the way you're taught by your teachers in the early part of your education. Um, but I would say the most overrated part of the uh, equation uh, is talent, that um, discipline is really the important part of it. How, and discipline, here's, here's discipline, here's how you measure discipline, that it's how much time you're willing uh, to put into this. I was talking to a writer the other day who's um, being told that her script uh, isn't ready. Well, she's rewritten it already three times, she said. Uh, well, David Kep, K-O-E-P-P, -P, a very, very successful writer who's uh, a former uh, student here, um, he wrote uh, two of the Jurassic Park pictures. Uh, uh, he wrote Spider-Man. He's a gigantically successful writer. He says the reason for his success is his ability to get through 17 drafts of a screenplay. So um, this young woman I was speaking to yesterday doesn't have the discipline. She doesn't want to give it the time that it that it takes. So it really does take uh, a lot of time. And I think that um, uh, it's harder to understand that when you're really uh, young uh, and um, easier to understand it <laughs> conversely when you're, uh, when you're more mature. In my book, uh, Essentials of Screenwriting, I write about my experience with my father, whom I mentioned earlier. He played uh, with all of the greats of the last century, including Don Pablo Casals, the master cellist. Um, they say he's Spanish. He's actually, he would say he's Catalan. Um, and he lived in Puerto Rico. He would not live in Spain under Franco. Uh, I live in Puerto Rico, uh, and I went to Puerto Rico to the Casals Festival. And there's a uh, he's now long deceased, but they still have the Casals Festival. Back then, he was alive. He wasn't playing cello, but he was conducting. And uh, I, I watched him teach. I saw him give some master classes, and the the artists would come in nervous. It's this is Casals, you know, um, the master the cellist in the world um, in his in his day and one of the all-time masters of cello. So you'd see her play and he would sit there and listen. And I grew up in the world of, of virtuoso world-class music and to me it sounded, you didn't just walk in off the street to take a lesson, you know, there was a shingle that said music lessons, you know. <laughs> didn't work like that. You had to be really good to study with Casals. So to me it sounded very, very good. She'd finish and he would sit there and he would nod sort of severely, um, and she'd be really nervous, you could just see it. And finally he would say, and by the way, the first time I saw this, I thought it was spontaneous, then I realized he does this every time exactly the same way. It's the way he works, the way he teaches. He would finally say, beautiful, beautiful, and then you could see the shoulders. It's funny, because my wife and I just saw Lynn Harrell and the uh, Philharmonic on Saturday night, and it was beautiful, it was quite remarkable. Um, talk about cello, 
virtuoso celli, cellists. Um, and you could see the shoulders relax, you know, on, on, on the, the woman who was, on the man who was a student in question. And he'd be kind of watching out of the corner of his eye for that. And as soon as they did relax, then he would say as if it was an afterthought, but really it was clearly the first thing on his mind was perhaps even more beautiful if the intonation and the phrasing and the... the, the he would really uh, take on the weaknesses and and um, the shortcomings of it and so on. But he'd won the safety of the artist. She felt like he, he was on her side. And that is our guiding philosophy here. I learned the most important lesson of my life, which is uh, the teacher went around the, the classroom asking everybody what their father did for a living. And one kid's father was a plumber, one, one kid's father was an electrician, this is Queens, and everybody kind of talked like this. And my turn came and I said my father was a musician, and I remember the teacher saying, no, 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 we're not talking about hobbies, we're talking about professions. I, I said, well, my father's a professor, you mean he gets paid to make music? He said, he actually does, yes. So. She said, oh, you mean like weddings and bar mitzvahs? I said, well, I don't think he's played any of those gigs in quite a while since he was like a high school kid. He, uh, he, he, he works for NBC. He's with the NBC Symphony, Tos uh, or Symphony Orchestra under Arturo Toscanini, which was a very big thing. Um, you know, their Sunday night broadcasts in the old radio era, you know, were uh, like the, the hottest item on, on radio. And um, so she was kind of impressed by that. And then she asked me, what instrument he plays, and I said bass, and she said, what's that, what do you mean? And so I explained what the bass was, that it looked like a violin, but it was much, much larger. It stood on the floor, and uh, the musician stood behind it. And she said, oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. That's, that's called a cello, she said. So I tried to explain the string family to her, uh, the violin, the viola, the cello, and the bass, and um, the reason I knew that wasn't because I was precocious, although I probably was precocious, but it was like the same reason the, the kid whose father was a plumber knew the difference between a hex wrench and a pipe wrench, and the kid whose father was an electrician maybe knew the difference between a voltmeter and an ammeter, I'm just guessing. Um, well, I could see she didn't like that. She said, wait a second, it looks like a violin, but it's much bigger. She said, that's called a cello. So I said the smartest thing I've ever said in my life. It's been downhill for me since that day in 1950 or 51, whenever it was. Um, I said, oh, okay, it's a cello, but I knew it wasn't a cello. And I knew, uh, more importantly, I knew two things. One, people in positions of authority, they don't know what they're talking about. And what an authority, you know, any, to a kid, a six-year-old, a first grader, uh, on the first day of school, any grown-up is, um, is an adult. I'm sorry, is a, any adult is, a, uh, is an authority. And a teacher is especially an authority, you know, an important authority. So here is um, this person of great authority, and she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's just wrong, first of all. Second of all, if you try to enlighten her and and tell her uh, the truth, inform her of just simple facts, gets mad at you. So f from that moment on, um, I've had a disdain and a kind of disregard for authority, and the irony in my life is that now I'm in a position of authority. There is something that I, have, uh, that I emphasize every day, and it is story. It's all about story. Story is everything else. We were talking earlier, a moment ago, about um, dialogue. I also said something about uh, character. Well, what is dialogue? What is character? It, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the stuff that the uh, protagonist or the other characters in the, in the movie speak, and it's what they do and what they say. It's, this, it's the story. The, um, the richest, uh, the densest, uh, the most analyzed and, and studied character in all of certainly English language dramatic literature and arguably world dramatic literature uh, is Hamlet. Certainly he's a candidate for, for the number one studied uh, character. Uh, was he crazy or does he feign uh, madness as part of his scheme to uh, bring justice to uh, his late father? 
and, and his father's memory. Um, uh, there are so many questions that are asked about Hamlet, uh, so many books written about his character. What is the playwright's description of Hamlet in the play? It's three words, Prince of Denmark. That's all Shakespeare tells us about Hamlet. So where does, there's nothing about melancholy, for example. Um, not in the description of the character nor anywhere in the play does that word appear. So where does this Hamlet guy come from? And the answer is what he does and what he says. That's what makes up a, a, a character. And again, to create a character like that takes a bunch of time <clears throat> because it's a story. It's really part of the story. These things don't break apart into separate, discrete uh, entities, but rather have functions together only when they are uh, linked as functions of one another. Character is story, as I said before. What is a character other than what she does and what she says? Okay. I have a friend um, who uh, is a TV writer and he has a partner, a writing partner, they collaborate. And so he told me that somebody said to them, oh, you guys work together, so like you do the character and he does the story? As if you could do that separately. Uh, characters don't exist outside of, of stories. Um, they exist only inside of stories. Again, they are what they, like Hamlet, they are what they do and what they say. So you can't, when people talk about a character-driven movie, they just mean a good movie. Okay, how about plot? Driven L by plot? Let me just point out to you how many movies and plays and great classics are just the name of the protagonist of the main character. For example, Hamlet, King Lear, Macbeth, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, um, uh, uh, Julius Caesar, that's just, how about go back to the Greeks, Medea, Oedipus, um, uh, look at the great movies, uh, uh, The Godfather, Citizen Kane, um, it's not always that way, but more often than not it is the name of the character that is also the name of the movie, the name of the protagonist. And I only mention it in this context because I'm trying to indicate to you that you can't separate story and character, which is more important. It's like asking somebody, what's more important to you, your heart or your lungs? There's a wonderful book, very underappreciated, by a writer who died a few years ago. Um, it's called Plots and Characters. And by the way, Plots is first, not by accident, and also in Aristotle's Poetics, the first book on dramatic writing, uh, he clearly says plot is what's really important, not character, because again, character flows out of plot. There isn't any character outside of a plot, and if there's a plot, there's automatically characters that are that are uh, are, are going to be in it. Um, so, uh, w once again, I just can't hammer enough on how. Uh, um, amateurs, dilettantes don't get that, that it's really about story and that what you, the real work of, of a writer is inventing the actions. Millard Kaufman is the name of the writer uh, who wrote the book Plots and Characters and he has one of the most timeless, brilliant lines in it that I've ever heard and here it is, uh, I've already said it, which is that it is action that defines character and not the other way around. I'm going to say it again. It's action that defines character and not the other way around. People who think it's the other way around are the kind of people who are doing these character workshops. We'll invent a, a character who has all these traits and qualities and characteristics and then we'll um, uh, turn her loose and see what, what she does. No. Define what she does. Tell us what does she do, and that'll tell us who she is. That's true in your dramatic narrative that you write for the screen. It's also true in your life, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, I like to think that I'm a moral, principled, um, reliable, decent person, but I look back at what I've done in my life and I see shortchanging um, myself and others, disappointing <laughs> myself and others, constantly, uh, frequently acting out of fear. Um, I would say my actions define me as a little bit of a coward. I'm easily, I'm afraid of a lot of things. Um, 
it's not the way I want to be, but, I, but again, it's what I do. It's the actions, the events, the incidents, the anecdotes in my life that tell me who I am and that tell anybody who, who they are uh, and um, that tell audiences in movies, in movie theaters looking at the screen, that's what tells them who those characters are. Tony Soprano uh, is a function of what he does. He's a vicious murderer criminal. He's also a father and a, and a uh, husband. He's also a troubled um, man who's having um, blackouts, fainting spells, and he's, he's worried. Uh, he has, he's so worried that he does a really wuss, uh, wimpish thing, which is engages a psychiatrist, you know, a therapist, a woman on top of that. Um, I mean, a mobster, a made man, and the mob doesn't do that. Um, and all of those things define for us who, who, who he is. Again, it's not like we've defined the character and then put him into the situations. We put him into the situations and then the situations define the character. There's a very famous book. Uh, it's called Adventures in the Screen Trade. Uh, William Goldman. And... Um, Goldman, usually successful writer, and its most famous line, the most famous line in the book is, um, nobody knows nothing, because um, it really is, this is a business where the exception is the rule, and uh, you just never know how it, it's going to come out, but there's a much better line in that book, it seems to me, that is overlooked by most people. He's at a meeting, Sidney Pollack and uh, the late director is at the meeting and he wants, he, Pollock wants to do a script that um, Bill has written and they're talking to the money guy in a restaurant and it's not going well. They're not, you can see it's not, this guy's just not interested in that film, the, you know, too risky, too whatever, he doesn't want to do it. And as it starts to get worse and worse, uh, and this is as described by uh, Goldman, Sidney Sidney Pollock says, wait a second, and he reaches for the script, and, he, and Pollock, real, uh, Goldman realizes, oh my God, oh no, he's actually going to now read to the investor, the potential investor, a passage from the script. And this horrifies Goldman, and he has the line that I'm focusing on, which is, now you have to understand, I hate everything I've ever written. That's William Goldman. He wrote Butch and Sundance, for God's sake. Uh, you know, hugely, hugely successful writer. There can't be, there are writers as successful as Bill Goldman, but none more so. Artists should not look back at their, at their work, and uh, if they do, they're going to be disappointed in it. They're not willing to put in the time that it takes. Uh, they have brilliant ideas, but as I've discussed in other uh, places and in other uh, other uh, videos, uh, the, the most overrated part of the screenplay equation is the idea. Ideas are really pretty useless and worthless. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm <laughs> repeating myself, but um, I am a, uh, uh, one of those people who believes that Breaking Bad is one of the greatest achievements in the history of civilization. I think it's really great, great drama. Um, so what's the idea that drives it? Uh, a, uh, a high school chemistry teacher um, gets a cancer diagnosis, and so he decides to go into the uh, methamphetamine trade um, with an incorrigible former student of his, a criminal, uh, you know, to sell drugs to support his family. That is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Many, many uh, companies shot that down. Um, and yet it is this triumphant uh, achievement, 62 hours uh, of a TV series, every frame of which uh, is engaging and, and, and captivating and um, uh, involving. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, so how did that happen? And the answer is they told a good story. It's where the story, uh, it's really all about story. That's what we believe at UCLA. That's, that's what I believe. A few years ago, I mean, imagine if somebody came up to you and, and said, hey, I have an idea for a movie. Uh, this guy stutters, uh, but he has to give a speech, so he hires a speech therapist. They work on the speech, and he gives the speech at the end of the movie. If somebody told you that that's going to win the Oscar for best picture and best screenplay, you figure uh, they're crazy. 
And yet that is, of course, uh, the king's speech. And um, again, I think it just demonstrates the, uh, uh, the value of story and the valuelessness of ideas. And I think that very young people are more into ideas. They have great ideas. I like to say when you have a great idea, if you have a really, really great idea for a, a screenplay, that's all you've got. I mean, what remains after that? Everything. The, the uh, characters have to be invented. The dialogue they speak has to be created. It has to be punchy and peppy and provocative um, and pungent. I'm just getting into peas now. Um, and poetic. And it has to be worth listening to all for itself just because there's something kind of charming about it. But beyond that, it can't be just for itself. It also has to uh, advance the story in a palpable, measurable, identifiable way. Likewise, expand the audience's appreciation of the characters. It takes time. Uh, for me to give you an idea about a movie, I can, you know, it takes a, a handful of seconds. To walk you through the story of the movie, it takes the length of the movie, a couple of hours. So that's where the value is. Sometimes people say to me, yeah, but, but, but Richie, novels are longer than a screenplay. My last novel, uh, and I don't mind bragging, it made the Times bestseller list, um, okay, just number 13 and only for a week, but that's not a small thing, <laughs> the Times list. Uh, that was about 236 pages or 245 pages, something like that, in typescript. I'm, I'm sorry, the published book. So in typescript, it was about 300 pages. Now at a screenplay should not be much more than a hundred pages. The last, the screenplays are getting shorter now, which I think is good. The last uh, job that I did, I had an assignment this past year, um, and that script came out, I think, at 93, 94 pages. Uh, and it's, it's full, it, it's complete. Uh, and my point is, and the reason I'm dwelling on these page counts, is uh, it's easier to write a, a longer thing than a shorter thing. And would seem counterintuitive, but think about it, there's a famous letter that Ernest Hemingway wrote. He was in Cuba, living in Cuba, and I believe he was writing The Old Man in the Sea, one of his later books, a wonderful book. Of course, everything he did was wonderful. And um, in the midst of working on the book, he wrote a long letter, it was nine pages long, to uh, Maxwell Perkins, the legendary editor um, who worked with a lot of famous writers, including Hemingway. And he was discussing various aspects of the book and whatever. And at the end of the letter, he says, well, that's about it for now, Max. Uh, please forgive me for writing such a long letter. I didn't have the time to write a short one. It takes more time to uh, do what artists have to do, which is to cull and select and throw away. So much screenwriting education is about structure and construction and building up. And I think there is some useful uh, time spent considering that. But ultimately, uh, creating dr dramatic narratives is not about building up. I think it's about tearing down and taking away. It's about discovery, dis, cover, taking the cover off and finding something that's already there. Um, I never knew a writer. I, I have a lot of experience myself as a writer. Uh, but that experience is... Um, leveraged exponentially by all the writers I've worked with very intimately, very closely over, uh, you know, now for 35 years here on campus with writers in our advanced graduate screenwriting classes, but also in the community. I, I am a script doctor. I'm a pretty busy script doctor. I give notes to lots of writers. Uh, no small number of those writers have deals at studios. They're coming to me and saying, you know, ask me the hard questions before the producer asks them becoming more and more routine, I think, in Hollywood, uh, when, even when you have a deal to consult with somebody before you actually submit it to the, uh, to the studio. And um, uh, so having done that has, has expanded my own experience, as I say, exponentially. And I've never known uh, a writer, I've never met a writer who wasn't surprised by things that happened in her story, by lines of dialogue that a particular character suddenly spoke. Uh, it's as if it kind of has a, a you know a life of its of, of its own, and it is a stupendous screenplay by Kushner. <clears throat> and and Tony was saying, a lot of people think you think the thing up in your head and then you write it down, but 
he says the writing down of it is sort of the thinking of it that there's a nexus between the pen or the keyboard the hands on the keyboard that kind of create it and you just never know and you have to live with that uncertainty uh, you have to sort of rejoice and in, in, in celebrate and embrace that uncertainty instead of um, trying to eliminate the uncertainty you look at the, the the studios today are what's less interesting than what they're doing now. They're doing prequels and sequels and items of franchises. What they're trying to do is minimize risk. Um, they're trying to make it so that when an audience goes to see a movie, they get what they expected. But when I go to the movies, I don't want to see what I expected. I want my expectations to be exceeded. I want to be turned upside down. I want to be frightened. I want to. I want my life to be changed forever. What it means for writers, in practical terms, is to stay open to the surprises. If you have a real idea in advance, exactly how it's going to go, that's going to lock you in and narrow you and and stunt your creativity. Uh, your character is going to do, surprise you. They're going to they're going to do things that you never thought they would do. That they seem to invent on their own to do. And that's what I was talking earlier about, which is dis discovery. And that the biggest mistake you can make is to try to haul it back. If it runs off the, the rails a little bit, that's great. Go with it and see where that takes you. And, um, and be surprised by, uh, be willing to be surprised by where you end up with it. Because um, otherwise it becomes intellectual, it becomes heady. Uh, and we need our heads, we need our intellect, but not in the movie theater. That's a place where we live, not in the head, but in the heart, in the belly, in the groin. It's not about understanding and knowing. Uh, it's about feeling. It's about, it's about passion. There's a really important place in our lives for rational, intelligent, expansive discourse and discussion, but not in the movies. The movies is a safe place to work out the lethal aspects of our nature, uh, to go hog wild and buck naked and crazy as a loon. That's what art is for. Get ready to throw stuff away. It's, again, it's not about building up and constructing. It's about throw, taking down and throwing away. Right. Writers, I like to tell writers, you, not, you, you need not merely to learn that you have to throw away, but you need to learn. This is what maturing is as a writer, loving to throw away. You want to see the best thing that's ever happened to writing? I don't know how, if we, if we can get this here, it's, a, it's jammed, it's a computer keyboard. And I'll just tell you that if I could get it into the frame, I could point to this key, it says delete. That's the best thing that ever happened for writing. And you have to learn that when you highlight a bunch of stuff, you realize, I don't need this, uh, this line of dialogue. I don't need this scene. And you highlight the whole thing, and then you hit delete, and the whole scene vanishes. If you get a good feeling out of that, then you're a mature writer. It'll take years and years to get to that. Most of the time, you're going to feel like, well, why are you going to feel that way? Well, because you took time to create that. You believed in it. And now you're throwing it away. What about the stuff you're writing now? Are you going to... Uh, how can you create anything more if you know that tomorrow you may throw this away? Yet that's what you have to do. And the truth is tomorrow you will throw away probably not all of it, but just most of it. And if you do that, eventually you'll have a whole work. You know, you'll have a whole screenplay. I, I have um, had some modest success in my career. Um, not just in, in film, working and making a living as a screenwriter, but also publishing in, in, with major publishers, uh, for the most part, actually, in my case, all New York publishers. The publishing business still is mainly New York, just like Hollywood is still Hollywood. And um, on a several occasions, I, I took something that I had written as a film, and um, in some instances, I'd actually had uh, uh, options, you know, made some money on it, but had never really ever uh, gotten it to where I wanted it to be. That is to say, a deal, you know, uh, that, uh, that got made into something that, that audiences could participate. And what I did was use the novel, uh, I'm sorry, use the screenplay as an elaborate outline for a novel. 
uh, no writing is easy, but it's easier once all the heavy lifting has been done. If you, once you've written a screenplay, you know who the characters are, you know almost all of the dialogue, certainly a lot of the dialogue, most of the dialogue. Uh, the story is all worked out. You now have merely to write it. <laughs> now, I, I pause on merely because there's nothing mere about writing. But um, it is easier to uh, just put the words on once all, you have all of the incidents and the events and the anecdotal stuff worked out. Uh, and then it becomes a, a, a question of description. Um, I have had uh, success at that. That is to say, couldn't make the movie happen, so wrote it as a novel, and then sold the novel uh, as a novel, was able to get the novel published, and then suddenly there was interest in it uh, as a novel. Um, that is to say, a, an adapted novel, adapted for for the screen. The uh, the current my my current gripe with Hollywood with the American film industry is the the refusal to do original stuff. Um, and uh, well, you can take an original screenplay and turn it into a novel, and then it's no longer original. Now it's an adaptation, and that's what they they prefer to do. So uh, you can kind of um, in a sort of a Zen surrender sort of a way, make it what they want it to want it to be. I also will tell you that I find greater satisfaction in writing novels. Um, they're less. They're easier. They're less. Uh, they're not easy, but they're easier. They uh, uh, are more tolerant of um, inefficiency and bad economy. I'm not saying you should be inefficient and uneconomical. And I, when I talk about uh, economical, I mean in terms of moving story freight, moving character freight with with a little bit of language rather than the other way around. And um, uh, you, you'll really get killed in a movie, in a screenplay, if, if it's inefficient. But in a novel, I think, because the, the viewer, the reader of the novel has the, the opportunity to turn the pages faster or even to skip over stuff uh, or, conversely, to go back and review stuff. Um, makes it somewhat uh, easier for the writer to, uh, to write it down. There are filmmakers out there who are great at, at creating moments that are exciting uh, and kind of fun to look at. Um, the Coen Brothers, for example, and I'm not a fan. Um, maybe I shouldn't be <laughs> saying stuff like this. Um, I think that they are able to uh, kind of dazzle you for a moment with a crazy, wacky thing that happens, uh, and then another one, and then another one. But after a while, it's just like uh, a catalog of crazy things. The difference between them, on one hand, and let's say Vince Gilligan and his writers on the other, or David Chase and his writers on the other hand, and I'm referring to the, uh, the founding voices that drive the Sopranos and Breaking Bad, the examples we're talking about, which I consider to be really outstanding drama models of, of great, great, great dramatic narratives, um, they create dazzling, crazy things too, but they don't just abandon it and go on to something else. They, if, you've seen the, um, uh, if you've seen Breaking Bad, you'll see stuff that's from the first season uh, that gets resurrected three, four <laughs> seasons later. You know, it's hard work to do that. You gotta keep track of everything. You gotta, uh, make it sort of coherent. You see a movie like um, Inherent Vice. I mean, you know, it's it's just blabbing, you know, crazy kind of people being nutty um, and very intense, you know. But what's it about? And I think they're largely making it up as they go along. I can't believe that they're not improvising a, a, a lot of that. Um, it's takes work on the part of the writer. In fact, it's the hardest work in the world to create a narrative, a story where everything fits, where you, where nothing can be thrown away, and there's nothing in it that um, you know doesn't serve the story, the, the purpose of moving that story forward. It's funny. At, at my class, the class which meets tonight, in the first class, I always brag about all of the scripts that got um, written in the class that became movies. Now, most of the people who succeed don't sell the scripts that they uh, write in the class, much less have them made into movies. They use them as showcases. They win representation. They win development deals and 
rewrite assignments and other kinds of, of uh, rewards. Um, but there are some that have actually been written right in the classes that became movies. Um, and uh, I brag to the eight writers around the table about those. First thing I do. The next thing I do is I tell them, now, please don't try to sell the scripts that you write in this class. And then I take a long silence. Uh, and I let people think about what seems like a contradiction. I've just been bragging about all the scripts that have sold out of the class, and here I am saying, please don't try to sell the scripts that you read in the class. And I point out to the student that you write in the class. And then I point out to the writers uh, that it's not a contradiction. I didn't, sell, don't, I didn't say don't sell the scripts that you write in the class. I said don't try to sell the scripts that you write in the class. If you're thinking about the sale while you're working on it, you are doomed. You are lost. Um, you're uh, intellectualizing, you're calculating, you're getting into all kinds of uh, um, processes that are that will militate against successful art. You're getting, again, too intellectual, too into your head when you think that way. You start to think about trends, what's popular, who might this be right for. Um, I once had a writer who'd been admitted to the program. It's extremely unusual that somebody's admitted and doesn't enter the program. Our so-called take rate, the percentage of people who are admitted who actually enroll is like 99%. Um, but there was one guy who came to me with a rude yellow legal pad. He'd been admitted. He wasn't sure he wanted to come and he wanted to know the uh, percentage of students that had agents after how much time, the median income for graduates at the five-year mark, the ten-year mark, uh, not only the uh, median, but the mean and also the average. I, I resisted telling them the mean and the average are the same. The median is different, but the mean and the average, uh, those are two synonyms. Um, and I said to him, I said, I could get all of those statistics for you that would show you, you know, that this is the, the best way to succeed in the movie business uh, to become a writer is to come to this program. I said, but I don't, I'm not going to do that for two reasons. The second reason, first, the second reason is I'm the professor. I give the assignments. I don't do the assignment. I mean, he's giving me all these <laughs> assignments, you know, and hey, I got tenure. I, I, I dish it out. I don't take it anymore. Uh, but first of all, I said to him, I don't think you will succeed. Um, and I, I hope I, I didn't say this cruelly. I said it truthfully. I said, I do not believe that you will succeed. If you come through this program, I, uh, if you enter this program, um, we've admitted you. We will welcome you warmly and we will treat you generously, but I don't think you're going to succeed. Uh, and he said, why do you think? I said, because you're sitting here asking me with this rude yellow legal pad, asking me about the median and the mean and the average and the dem and who has the agent and the dem. What about story and, and character and dialogue and stuff like that? Themes, uh, lessons, the, the sorts of of things that, that come out of art, you know, uh, you're already focusing on uh, um, the future and how things are going to stack up. Um, they're probably not going to stack up, you know, and, and I was serious. This was not reverse psychology trying to, you know, convince them to, to come. We, whenever anybody, uh, there's two kinds of questions I, I never answer. One is, uh, should I pursue this, you know? Uh, the, well, the answer is no. If you have to ask, then you shouldn't do this. Um, it's too frustrating. Again, Philip Roth, yesterday's New York Times, writing is frustration. It's frustration, not to mention humiliation. Quote, close quote. Roth, this isn't some newcomer trying to make his way through the publishing business. This is the superstar author of, of the 31 books. Bestseller after bestseller after bestseller after bestseller. Movie deals up the wazoo. And he says it's frustration and humiliation. Don't go into it if there's something else that you can do. It's kind of crazy. It's not smart. I mean, I mentioned that my dad was a bass player. He had great success, made a lot of money. And what was he doing? He was dragging horse hair, which is what the bow is made out of. It's the tail of a horse, a violin bow or, or a bass bow, across sheep gut. Uh, the strings are made out of the intestines of sheep. And uh, imagine doing that for a living, dragging horse hair across sheep cuts so that it makes a sound, and then claiming that you think people will pay to hear this sound. They'll line up in the snow 
and wait outside for hours to pay big money to sit in a chamber where for a couple of hours women and men uh, will do that, will, you know, blow air through tubes like flutes and clarinets and so on. And um, I mean, we were, I mentioned we were at the Philharmonic on Saturday, there's a guy beating a timpani and somebody doing bells. Uh, you know, this is like, we had so-so seats, so they would cost $230 the pair, you know. I mean, it's crazy. Art's not smart. It's kind of dumb. And um, if you're really, really smart, you don't go into it. This is not for really, really smart people. Um, you got to be dumber if, than that if you want to succeed in, in creative expression. You got to be a little crazy. From beginning to end, the least we want uh, is not to be bored. I mean, I go to the movies uh, uh, and see screeners scandalously. I'm going less and less to theaters and looking more and more at screeners. I used to feel guilty about not going to the um, theaters. Now I feel guilty about not screening the screeners. And, and uh, the reason is usually I am bored. I think most art is, is pretty bad. Um, most paintings, most sculpture, um, most literature, most uh, music is lousy. Now that also may seem like a cynical and a and a uh, dark thing to say, but it's the opposite of that. The truth is um, uh, that uh, uh, the um, it, the stuff that is contemporary, um, much of it is going to be pretty bad. Some of it will be brilliant. What happens is that. It, the bad stuff falls away. Um, you go, I was in New York not too terribly long ago, and I was in the museum, of, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of my favorite museums. And I didn't see uh, a single painting there that wasn't timeless and eternal, uh, that didn't deserve to be there. And you could get the impression from that that the paintings are somehow worthy all the time. But what you don't realize, a lot of people don't realize, is that for every painting that hangs at the Met, there are 10,000 stupid, worthless, jerky, amateur paintings. Now, there's nothing wrong with... I think it's wonderful that people tried to paint and tried to be creative and took a shot at it. Um, but <clears throat> it's unusual that it's worth bothering somebody else about. That is to say, there's something in the work uh, that merits the attention and the consideration of the time of, of an audience, an observer. Um, in film, uh, because it is contemporary, even more so television, because it's in our face now, uh, there hasn't been the chance for the stuff, the bad stuff to drop away. So we think that it's uniquely bad when it, it isn't. It's just as bad as other, as other art. Um, fortunately, the little bit of really, really good stuff is enough to change your life and, and make it worth engaging uh, all, of the, all of the stuff so that you, you do see the, the, uh, uh, the, the good stuff. Uh, there's um, uh, it, it, people. People say, How, "Why don't they make good movies now, like they used to in the '30s and the '40s?" Did they make good movies in the '30s and the '40s? They did. There were a lot of really good ones, but there were also a lot, a lot of lousy ones. We just don't remember them. Um, I think 50, 60 years from now, they'll be saying, "Why don't they make good movies like they did back in the early, uh, you know, new millennium?" Because the people will have forgotten. Um, the Hunger Games. I, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the Hunger Games. I think people are going to forget about it. Um, but they're going to remember um, uh, uh, the Imitation Game. They were into games today, I guess. Uh, isn't that the movie? That, uh, yeah, about touring and, and so on. Um, so uh, uh, we, the least we want, uh, when I say don't be boring, I'm saying that's the very least that I want from a, a work of art. Uh, we're talking now about dramatic narratives. You know, if you, I was at the Louvre in Paris and I saw the, uh, the Mona Lisa, among others. Uh, how much time did I spend with it? A minute? Um, if I'd spent three minutes with it, that would have been a long time. If I sat quietly now for just a few seconds, you'd feel how, how, uh, how heavily time weighs. Do you feel no, I'm, I'm just waiting for... Uh, 
So you, if I get quiet <laughs> even for two seconds, you get nervous and you jump in. I don't blame you. That's my that's my point. I see. Sorry. Okay. Um, no, 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 not at all. That's you help. You're you're helping me. Um, the uh, the but the most we want from that's the least we want. Um, I have a deal with my wife, which is if I start to nod out during a movie, she's supposed to let me do that unless I'm snoring and, and wheezing and, and spraying everybody around us and, and bringing disgrace and discredit and humiliation upon us. Uh, it's up to the movie to keep me awake. And um, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, I used to like fight it. If I started to drift during a movie, I would fight it like, you know, hey, sort of, I got deep breath and trying to, you know, pay attention. Because now, I, I, if I start to drift, that's it. I'm going, I'm going to nod out in this one. It, it, it just it's just not worth seeing, you know. I've walked into movies where I was really weary, hadn't slept very well, but it was a good movie and it woke me up. Um, so that's the least we want. Don't be boring. And if that's all you do, that's an incredible achievement. But again, that's the bottom. Uh, the t what's the top? And the top is I want my life changed completely the way great art does. I want it turned upside down and transmogrified. I want to be uh, transported. Uh, and that's what Breaking Bad did to me. That's what The Sopranos uh, did to me. I just, my life is different, and, you know, uh, uh, constantly because of my exposure to, to that, that great art. And that's what great art should do at the top end. It should just change your life forever. There's this expression on Broadway, they don't come out whistling the scenery. Uh, you can't, uh, people don't go, I love beautiful cinematography, but if that's all you have, it's really, really old in about five minutes. There's got to be a story. It's all about story. I'll tell you, in the earliest days of movies, 100 years ago, now about 110 years ago, um, well, actually, going back almost 130, 140 years to the invention of, of the motion picture camera, Thomas Edison and all of that, um, the very first image ever, uh, the very first moving picture image ever recorded is a, a trolley, a trolley car moving down the main street of Orange, New Jersey. Why in the world, how did that, in the world did that come to be the first a moving picture image and the answer is first of all that's where Edison's studio was and um, when he was <laughs> finished building the camera he needed a lot of light so he went outdoors and um, wanted to photograph something moving you don't invent a moving picture camera and then try it out on a, a, a vase with a rose in it you know uh, you want something that moves well they have trolley cars going down the main street there in at that time in that town in New Jersey and so he photographed that. And for a number of years, people were just blown away. Look at that, it moves! You know, they, they, they were stunned to see a, a picture that moved. But very quickly, that became wearying. All right, been there, done that. Adios. Um, so then they started to have um, scenes, moving pictures from all around the world, from the great, uh, you know, the, the wonders of the world. Some of the very earliest moving picture images are of Bedouin tribesmen uh, in flowing robes uh, riding camels past the pyramids at Giza in Egypt. Um, the Great Wall of China with um, Chinese, indigenous Chinese um, uh, making their way with carts along the wall, on the wall, next to the wall. Um, the, uh, they shot uh, very, very early images of um, uh, Victoria Falls or in South America, Iguazu Falls with uh, Amazonian uh, natives in their native garb, uh, this great cascading waterfall. So people were, were excited to see that stuff for a little while, you know, because it wasn't just moving, but it was famous stuff. You no longer had to bother to go to Egypt to see the pyramids. You could watch it in, in a movie theater. I, I think probably it's a better experience <laughs> to see it uh, in person. But the point is, after a while, everybody was bored with that, after a very little while. And then comes 1902 or 3 or 4 or 5, I don't remember exactly when, and it's the, um, the great train robbery. Suddenly it's a story a narrative that's been created that, that they made up. Likewise, the Melier brothers 
in uh, France doing um, a trip to the journey to the moon, trip to the moon, whatever it was called, an actual story that they made up and that they filmed. Everything has changed since then. The movies are no longer shorts, they're long. Um, they're no longer in black and white, they're in color. They're no longer silent, they have sound. Um, nowadays with, with mobile, you know, with mobisodes, TV series is all different kinds of lengths of, of films. So there's been a tremendous amount of change, but one thing has not changed, has not changed in 110 years, and that is story. It's all about narrative, it's all about story now. And that's what will get people to, to go to uh, the movies. Not um, some technical achievement, um, but a, a, a creative, artistic achievement, and that is, again, the creation of a dramatic narrative, the telling of a story. It's all about stories.